Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, if you don't know this about the Christmas story, uh, one, I'm going to help us know exactly about the Christmas story. But if you don't know about the Christmas story, there's a moment in it that reveals, I think, something that you and I right now are longing for. It's not just this uh, ancient something that happened, and it's not just this moment that we think about going, well, that sure was neat about just the baby. Oh, it's deeper than that. In fact, not that I've got your houses bugged. I promise I don't. Um, not, at least not all of you. Anyways, uh, I, what I want to do is this. Uh, we have an opportunity to open up a moment where the Bible, where God himself joins you in your life in one of the most realistic ways ever. I, I want to show you this moment in, in the story because it's, it's amazing. Uh, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others. The armies of heaven, and imagine what that would be like. Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. You've got the armies of heaven declaring, which is interesting, declaring that uh, peace on earth has arrived. What's happening, and you may not know this, is about 700 years before that moment, something was spoken, it's called prophecy, it's foretold about what would happen when this guy, Messiah, Jesus, would show up and bring peace. It's, in fact, let me show you, if you don't know this already, this was way before Jesus shows up. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Now here's how Jesus is detailed. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. It's like a lot of times when you cry out to God going, I just need to talk. Uh, mighty God, when you want him to enforce and provide in a major way, eternal Father, yeah, heaven, but Prince of Peace. It's described that when he shows up, the Prince of Peace, uh, if, you're, if you don't regularly speak Hebrew in your home, let me help you understand. Uh, uh, the word would be shalom. You probably have heard that before. The word would be the prince of shalom, the deliverer of shalom. And if you'd let me say it on our behalf, we read in the Christmas story and then typically in our home, we then open up presents and we read about this incredible prince of peace who has shown up. The arrival of Jesus has brought peace, but then somewhere back in here, some of us are going, not in my house. You think about globally, According to the Bible, Jesus would deliver peace. Again, I will bring it up. <laughs> I don't see it. There, there are people all over the world going to what you and I would call literal war. Then you, if you allowed me just to kind of come a little bit closer than the global wars and come into maybe something more personal, uh, most of us know at least a, a marriage or two or 10 where there is no peace between the two of them. Most of us are familiar with at least someone who grew up uh, in a home where mom and dad didn't be the mom and dad that they should have been. And so when, when it says that when Jesus came, peace! Yet many of us have our own stories, right, of like uh, not seeing peace, like the Prince of Peace to deliver, like the guy who's bringing peace, he shows up. Yeah, that, was it just that moment? Was it just back then that, that they were getting peace? Then you gotta uh, let it be messed with you that no, because Mary and Joseph all of a sudden have to run for their lives and go off to Egypt and, and you've got a bunch of crazy going on and then that goes straight into your head right now. A study just came out about you and I. I'd like to tell you about you and I. It says that two out of three adults right now would say in the last couple years our stress levels have gone up. Now, you, you probably didn't need a research project to know that. You're like, <laughs> you wanna be paid whatever that researcher was paid, I get that. <laughs> but, but you know what, the, you know what it also said? Three out of five adults would describe not just stress, three out of five adults would say that the issues that they're currently facing are overwhelming, and that's a strong word. 
But Crispus says, Crispus says the Prince of Peace is here. Would you let me at least bring this stuff up where you would say, yes, please? Because some of us are saying, I so maybe the, the Bible's false. Maybe this is all false. Maybe this is just religion. And some of us are going, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I think a lot of us could say this world that we're currently living in could be best described as broken. Yet Christmas tells us the Prince of Peace showed up, the Prince of Shalom. And uh, I'll tell you about your life. When what's important breaks, <laughs> Our peace can break down. Anyone else would be like, mm, amen, no, no. You just privately say it. I, I don't, I'm just curious. For those of you, like, when, when you have something break down or, or when you lose peace, is anyone with me that sometimes that's specifically car related? Anyone? <laughs> I just need to know if I'm the only human, okay. There is something, and I, I'll tell you a story of, like, I got problems when it, I mean, it, it, it takes peace for me and like it makes it in a distant land. I, I, I hate car problems more than a lot of other problems. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, my, my first big purchase when I was a single guy out of college was a 1999 Volkswagen Passat. Look at this sweet baby, this is awesome. <laughs> now this isn't it though. This isn't it because back then, well we didn't take pictures of everything and so uh, mine was far more cooler than this. I had custom wheels tinted windows that were very illegal and a subwoofer in the back that made everyone mad at me and I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> no, I couldn't afford it if you're wondering. It just, it was one of those first purchases post-graduating and sure, let's go for it. Uh, one of the questions I did not ask when purchasing this vehicle was, uh, so what's the maintenance look like on this thing? I just liked what it looked like. Uh, so fast forward, uh, I'm married, uh, and Katie calls me one day. I'm having a great day golfing, and uh, she says, hey, I'm on the side of the road. I'm like, that's weird. You shouldn't be on the side of the road. What are you doing there? And she begins to tell me that the vehicle, my prized possession, is no longer running. And I'm thinking, oh, must be time for a new, I have no idea because I don't know anything about cars. but. So it got towed to the only place in town where we were living who would work on a car that, well, that was made from overseas. <laughs> and uh, I go there, I remember that, I get called, hey, we're ready, uh, Mr. Cananda, you just come, I was like, cool, I go there, I'm wondering, I don't know if I can afford the $100 this is gonna be, or the $150 this is gonna be. See, you're laughing at me. Uh, I'm just telling you, that's what I was thinking in my head, and, uh, and the guy looks at me, I think I had the face where it was the clueless face. And he told me, he goes, hey, your, your car's like done, done. And I'm like, well, good, what do I owe you? And he's like, no, like junkyard done. <laughs> and uh, what I didn't know, maybe this is just helpful for you, uh, there's a thing called like a timing chain or something. If it breaks, uh, just, just go to the dealership and find another vehicle. At least in my case, it was that. So, uh, I panicked. You ever been in a situation where you didn't predict it, you've got a problem, and you panic? That's what I did. I did what maybe you've done too. So it's time, logically, to go buy another vehicle and it needs to be brand new because I don't want any of these problems ever again. And so I took the existing loan that I already had on that vehicle that's at the junkyard, rolled it into a new car loan. Yeah, see, smart, I've learned my ways, okay? <laughs> And the, and the pressure, it got to me. I'm telling you a lighthearted story. Because if you look at some more personal things in your life, you would, I think, agree that uh, pressure can lead to panic. And many of us actually know that um, in life, when you feel pressure and tension, many of us who are not grounded with God begin to make choices that one of the first things that goes away is our peace. But Christmas says the Prince of Peace showed up. Why do we have this? Why does this happen? It's something that you and I have been longing for, that peace would be real. And here's what I've learned. Most of us don't know what peace really 
is. So I want to take you on a fast, and I mean very fast, <laughs> theological word study lesson of the Bible. This will be fun for those of you that sounded very uninteresting. You know, let me, <laughs> let, let me, let me show you this. I just want to, if you don't know what peace is, let's just see if you do. Uh, Here, this is in the Bible, Joshua. He followed the commands that Moses, the Lord's servant, had written in the book of instruction. Make me an altar from stones that are uncut and have not been shaped with iron tools. You don't need to be a theologian to understand what that just said. Being commanded to build an altar for God, and there's even clear instructions on the stones that are being used to be uncut. What I'm gonna tell you is in the original language, it's shalom. You and I say uncut. There it was uh, shalom, which means complete, meaning unblemished, meaning that the rock is complete. There are no cracks in it. There are no problems with it. And they were to build an altar that would be just like that, make an altar from stones that are shalom, that are fulfilled, that are complete. Let's keep going, I told you I'd do this fast. Job says, uh, you will know that your home is safe. When you survey your possessions, nothing will be missing. No one wants to go to their home and all of a sudden find that stuff is gone, right? Uh, Right? Okay, just making sure. I don't know. The word there you and I see is safe. The original word is shalom. Peace. A home has peace peace, when it is safe. When you have fear, what do you rarely have? Peace. The Bible's teaching us all about peace, and we need to know this. Uh, you can go to uh, First Kings. This is fun. Uh, three times each year, Solomon presented burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar he had built for the Lord. Now watch this. He also burned incense to the Lord, and so he finished the work of building the temple. Um, I think you're tracking with me right now. What do you think the original word was? Shalom, peace. The meaning of shalom being finished, complete. One more for those of you who are at odds with someone right now. This might make sense. Maybe you've experienced this. If an animal is grazing in a field or a vineyard and the owner lets it stray into someone else's field to graze or dogs poop on your yard, whatever, (laughs) then the animal's owner must pay compensation from the best (laughs) of his own grapes, grain or grapes. The word there was shalom. In other words, when you wrong someone, not that you've ever done that, but when you wrong someone and you are a follower of God, you are called to actually bring shalom back to the relationship. And in this case, it was actual to bring compensation for the thing that was broken or needed repaired or replenished to restore. So here, if you missed all that, like I did in class, here. Peace, shalom, completing what was incomplete, restoring what was broken. Hopefully, you're going to begin to connect the dots of when Jesus shows up as a baby, and we wonder, what's the big deal about a baby showing up? I know we celebrate, and I know it's a big deal, but you and I ought to know that when, it, when it's spoken that the, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom has arrived, and the people were ecstatic about this, literally going, this is the most amazing thing ever, it's because they long for what you and I long for, Peace, completeness, restoration, reconciliation. We crave that the broken would no longer be broken. As soon as you learn of someone that you love who has an incurable disease, or as soon as you lose someone that you care about, as soon as a relationship dissolves and breaks, you and I immediately begin to crave going, this shouldn't be, right? That's natural. And so the arrival of Jesus wasn't just a game to start a religion. It was to bring peace for you, for for all of us. And so I could end the sermon there and say, all right, you got peace. Best of luck. But when the Bible talks about the Prince of Peace showing up, do you know that it tells us more that we rarely read. 
I want to show you something. This has been profound in my own life. After it says the Prince of Peace is going to show up, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. In other words, when Jesus showed up and brought peace, did you know that it's never going to end? Some of us are going, I think it ended. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. I highlighted that for you. We'll get to it. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. If you missed it, again, those of you got, if you, if you knew, if this is brand, time, like brand new time to Fountain Springs Church, you need to know the pastor of this church did not do very well in school. So I needed pictures. <laughs> do you know what that verse just said? It said that the Prince of Peace would show up. The Prince of Peace, we're talking royalty, right? We're talking about a throne being established. What that just said is not only would the Prince of Peace show up, but here's how the Prince of Peace will deliver peace. With righteousness and justice, justice and righteousness. And I still don't have some of you because you're like, that still doesn't help me. Let me take the first one, justice. Don't answer out loud, don't raise your hands. Have you ever been hurt by someone and wanted to get back at them? I'd be willing to guess that many of us right now have a lack of peace because of the hurt that we've encountered in our lives. I would, I would, I would venture to guess that in your own life right now, much of the stuff that you stew about is in the justice world, basically thinking about who's gonna get what they deserve. Some of us have gotten bitter about this because we've been hurt and we've wrestled with that. And for most people, what gets you going the most and what robs most of us of peace is that desire way inside of you that that person would be punished. Meanwhile, in the Bible, Deuteronomy says, vengeance is mine and retribution. Meaning God said, you don't have to get back at other people. I will take care of justice. Meanwhile, you and I, instead of reconciliation, are considering revenge. And for many of us, we wrestle through life because of what our mom or our dad or a best friend or a husband or spouse or wife or kids or coworker or someone did. Or maybe you just got cut off in traffic and you visualize in your head how you would somehow remove them off the road. <laughs> and little did you realize that in that moment you had no peace. Yet I know enough about human beings that you crave peace. Could it be that your lack of peace is refusing to forgive? This has been very profound to me because I'm just like you. I could easily come up with a list right now of the people who have hurt me and I could easily if, if you wanted, which I'm not going to do this, tell you of the times in my life that I wish God would do something with them. And if he wasn't going to, I would like to. I love how the Christmas story actually goes right into our kitchens and says, let's have a real conversation. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, showed up and is reigning on a throne with justice, meaning you don't have to try to get back at him. That's not the only thing he's running with. Remember that. Let me get, let's go back to picture time. Talks about righteousness. There, it's different than justice, but actually there is a similarity to it. Uh, righteousness. If I can give you some, some helpful on, like, tips on this. Righteousness is being right with God, and there's, there's the character of God at play. In other words, like, are you good enough? The Bible will use terms like uh, getting right with God. Or, or, or being, being at peace with God, I find it powerful that in the, in the scripture that says, all right, let's talk Christmas, this kid is gonna arrive as the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom is gonna bring not only justice, is not only gonna take care of, of what has been done wrong, but righteousness. Okay, I'll, 
what you and I have done wrong. A lack of peace could be refusing to accept forgiveness. Oh, I have this conversation regularly where someone would say, oh, I can forgive what others have done to me. I just can't seem to forgive myself. Jesus shows up to say, I want to give you peace. And it wasn't an end to all the physical wars that you and I continue to see. It wasn't an end to the bickering that we see everywhere that we go, most specifically on the internet. It wasn't resolving all of the stuff that we see on the outside. Jesus came as the Prince of Peace for your soul saying, I know you will be wronged and have been wronged. I will deal with that for you. Please hand it over to me. And not only they have done you wrong, but you have done wrong. Romans 5, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. I thought, I wonder if some of us would miss this. What do I do? Let's underline it. What Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Not how good you have been. And here's what I know. Many of us are hoping that we are good enough where it outweighs our bad times to where one day God will say, I like you, you can join me. But Jesus shows up as a baby on a throne, the Prince of Peace, and the throne is described as justice and righteousness. So that stinking Christmas story. You've got an unwed, pregnant teenage girl. Where'd she get her peace? You've got on the other side, you've got a dude who's engaged to her and she told him, I'm pregnant and it's not yours. Where'd he get his peace? How about the magi that show up that find out that that the king wants to do damage to a lot of people and now they find themselves coming to worship but then scrap the long-term worship. Now they have to try to escape. Where did they get their peace? What about the shepherds? If you don't know about the shepherds who were socially ostracized, seen as the bottom level of all people, they were never told anything about anything. They were accused of every wrongdoing, but what we get is they get angels showing up going, hey, here's some awesome news. Where'd they get their peace? I think I know. Because all of them likely would have known something that was written in Isaiah. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. Shalom, complete, finished. Let me help you. Uh, You will be able to have peace in the midst of any and all circumstances if you trust in God, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. What Jesus was bringing and delivering was what people had longed for. They knew their biggest problem wasn't their disagreement with their neighbor. (laughs) They knew their biggest problem wasn't actually even some government issues. Their biggest problem was their soul. And so if you wanna know why people are so ecstatic, it's because they've been holding on to promise after promise after promise that one day they wouldn't have to sacrifice these animals to fix some stuff. They wouldn't have to do all of this religious stuff just to be right with God, that a Messiah would show up, the Prince of Peace, of Shalom, and he would complete it all, he would finish it. Here's what they knew. Peace is found in God, not circumstances. And do you know where most of us are hunting for our peace? Our circumstances. Now you know if you've been here long enough, I have a tendency to offend people, so I thought why not put that in the Christmas sermon too? (laughs) So here, let me, I can flip this on you and say it in a completely different way, but say the very same thing. What, what is it like to, to actually find peace in God in that circumstances? The opposite is, is to want the kingdom without the king. 
We want the circumstances, but God, can you, can you just stay over there? I'll need you in a minute. I, w- I want this. It's our craving that we want the kingdom of God because what he promises and talks about is amazing. Have you been lacking peace in your soul because you've been trying to enjoy the kingdom without trusting the king? And so I think Christmas begs of us a moment that you and I give our attention to that question where we say, wow, I have been worried a lot, stressed a lot, full of anxiety. I'm at odds with so-and-so and and struggling with this, and I just seem to always be thinking about what is broken in this world. David, I don't want that anymore. Well, Jesus said, then give it to him. It doesn't mean that all your problems will go away, but it does mean that your soul is safe, Vengeance is no longer your role? Come on. What if you could just leave today going, I don't have to get back at them. God's gonna take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. Burden off our shoulders. And what if you could walk away today without living in shame, letting God take that from you as well? So here's what I wanna do. I want us to have, I mean, it's Christmas time. I think we should all talk to God. <laughs> so would you, would you bow your heads, uh, close your eyes, and, and uh, if this is new to you, all I'm asking you to do is to focus, and I think most of us need to bow our heads and close our eyes to focus. If you've, if you've never processed letting the king be king, if you've never let him have your life where you just surrender to him. It's not about joining a religion. It's not about being perfect and you all of a sudden knowing everything. It's about going, you know what? Uh, vengeance isn't a good job for me. Trying to be good enough, I don't seem to be able to do it. And so a Christian is simply someone who says, you know what? I'm putting all my trust in the Prince of Peace who will take care of justice and righteousness. So, um, if you've never invited God into your life, you can just, like, in your head right now, privately, speak to him. Maybe, maybe something like this if you want words to help, but, but you can do this on your own now. Just, God, I am sorry. I have been putting other people and even myself on the throne. And God, I want you to be king of my life. I want you to reign with justice and righteousness. God, I want peace that comes from you. So God, today, I hand my life over to you. I hand the throne of my life over to you. Forgive me of all of my sins. Forgive me of all the things that I feel shame about and regret about. Forgive me of everything I've ever done against you or anyone else. God, would you wash me white as snow? Lord, forgive me. Help me to forgive me and help me to forgive others. I give you my life and I surrender it over to you. I pray this in the name of Jesus who is the Prince of Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Lord, thank you. Amen. So I want to invite you to respond. Uh, I want to invite you into a moment that I think you should treasure for the rest of your life. And what I'm going to invite you into will take some courage, some bravery. If you prayed that prayer with me, it needs to move beyond some private conversation between you and God. And oftentimes, if you read through the Bible at least, you'll learn that it wasn't just like this private conversation between God and the person, but then they would walk it out. They would connect their head to their heart, to their hands. So I want to invite you into something. Every location, um, there are bells at the front of all the stages. And here's what I'm gonna invite you to do. If you prayed that prayer with me and you've decided to receive the peace of Jesus Christ this Christmas season, I want you to come up and as a symbol of that actual thing that's real to you, I want you to ring the bell. 
you know, you probably are aware of this, that when someone, uh, when someone is done with their cancer treatments, oftentimes they'll walk down the hall and they'll ring the bell going, I've done this, I've completed this. A lot of times uh, when, when you hear the bells of a church ringing, you know that it's an invitation uh, into a relationship with God. It's, it's just saying, hey, something important is going on or has been done. So I think it's very appropriate in this Christmas season that if you've decided to follow Jesus, receive his forgiveness, and welcome the peace of Jesus into your life, I want you to come up and ring the bell. So uh, here's how we do this. Uh, you shouldn't do this anonymously. In fact, if you want to bring a friend with you, you can do that. But I want you to come up and, uh, and write your name on a card just so, like, hey, you're declaring them. This, this moment has a name connected to it. And then, and then I want you to ring the bell. And, and frankly, you can ring it however you want to ring it. You can ring it softly. You can ring it loudly. You can ring it a bunch but we're gonna worship the Prince of Peace together while I think some of us come up and ring the bell of peace that we've invited Jesus into our lives. So here's how I'd like to do this. I'm just gonna count down and, uh, and then turn the service over to you. And that will be your cue as you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you to come up and ring a bell and acknowledge this moment for the rest of your life. So uh, here's how I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm just gonna count down and then it's yours. Three, two, one. Respond to God.